Welcome to Beyond Disruption, where you'll learn how emerging tech is changing the world of accounting, business, and finance. Our guest experts break down the latest news in everything from blockchain to robotics, artificial intelligence to human intelligence. Tune in to find out how you can stay ahead of the curve. Hello from our London office. I'm Kyle Hannum, and this is the Go Beyond Disruption podcast. In this episode, adaptive leadership driving adoption in times of disruptive change, we'll be talking about change management, the importance of communications, and delivering successful transformation across all levels of the organization. And yes, that includes the C-suite. And we'll be doing that with our expert guest, organizational consultant, Dr. Jeremy Lurie, who will help us answer questions like... How do we get people to adopt change? How do we work with those that resist it? And how do we get projects back on track? So let's get started. Hello, Dr. Lurie. Where are you speaking to us from today? Hi, Kyle. I'm actually in Chicago, Illinois today with clients. Well, thank you very much for joining us on a podcast from what I know, uh, because we are recording this in early 2019. It is very cold where you are right now. Uh, But you know, never mind the weather, we'll still look forward to sharing your experience and insights with our community around the world. Now, some of them may already be aware of your work, and I know you'll be speaking shortly at an AICPA conference. Um, but let's just give you a, a couple of lines. Uh, for those people who don't know about you, you are a talented organizational consultant. Uh, you partner with your clients to improve performance and drive adoption of change. And with more than 20 years of progressive experience as a consultant, uh, you're seen as a trusted advisor to CEOs and senior leadership among organizations that range from small and mid-market businesses to uh, Fortune 500 corporations. So what has that left out about you? What else do you do that connects with our topic today? Well, before I started my firm, Plus Delta Consulting, and joined Senior Lewax Consulting Practice, I worked at both PricewaterhouseCoopers and Anderson Consulting. And for several years in these big firms, I led countless organizational change efforts, implemented more technology systems than I can name. Many of those projects, though, they felt like forced changes, where a CIO or maybe a CFO simply signed a contract to buy a new ERP package or upgrade their outdated legacy systems. My goal since starting my practice and you know, furthering my career has always been about creating positive change such that these digital transformation efforts can actually be enjoyable or positive changes, not the forced changes that I led before. I'm getting a sense that you feel you can make technology a a fun thing. Is that right? Uh, Actually, yes, Kyle. I mean, that's our goal every time we start a new project with a new client. That is a tall order. I've heard people claim to be able to do it, but you've obviously done it time and time again. What's what's the secret? How How do you go around doing that? Well, we increase organizational awareness and stakeholder involvement throughout the change effort so that everyone gets involved and engaged throughout the project. And that way, they're much more committed to the changes when we implement them. We want people to learn new skills and feel more valued in their jobs at work because of these implementations. And our goal, hopefully through that, is that they um, hate them a little bit less, like them a little bit more so that they truly can be fun experiences. Sounds like a good goal. Well, we know that disruption is a constant. Things have always been changing. In the context of the work that you've been doing and the clients that you've worked with, what was the last big disruption that you saw in the profession? What happened to those that didn't adapt? Because this is more than just a theoretical thing that has to happen. How did it actually change the organizations you were working with for real? One of the biggest disruptions that I've been involved in and that we're continuing to experience today is tied to succession planning. And the many baby boomers throughout the world who are moving towards their retirement without having capable, qualified successors ready to replace them. And one of the most positive change efforts that I've been a part of uh, happened when the president and CEO of a global organization transitioned out and transferred his management responsibilities to his you know, previously direct report. Uh, The project was a huge success, uh, not because of me per se, but because we got the right people involved and everybody impacted, understood what was going on. Anyone who had a vested interest in this leadership transition was a part of the process. And we communicated with them one conversation at a time and shared with them what they needed to know every step of the way. 
you know, we led another project, a, a digital transformation effort with a medical group of doctors and clinicians that didn't go so well. Uh, we were implementing new technology to eliminate a lot of manual data entry and paper processing. Uh, it was a great project when we started. We had a very high energy design session with all of those data processing folks in a room. And we asked them, help us figure out how we can improve your processes. Uh, by the end of this three-day event, they were so excited by what they'd accomplished. But unfortunately, that was until we invited in the chief medical officer to review our work. And his first comments were priceless. We couldn't have scripted it any better. He said, this is amazing, as he looked at all the flip charts and the work around the walls. Unfortunately, he didn't stop there, because after a short pause and taking his breath, his next words were, if we can accomplish this, we won't need any of you. And you can just imagine the faces dropped, the mouths, you know, literally hitting the floor, and the group morale at the very beginning of this 15-month project Many of them just started looking for a new job that very next day. And that's the kind of conversation we often hear in the profession where people are talking about what automation may mean. And there's all sorts of misconceptions and ideas about what this may mean. And, you know, the story you've just communicated there is, is the kind of management buy-in that perhaps you, you don't need. But obviously, there's a different way to do it. So how do we get leaders to champion these change efforts so that this doesn't happen? What specifically do you do with them? It begins with defining success for the project. We need to be very clear about our intended results for the changes right from the start. With this future focus in mind, as we figure out where we're going, we then work with all the leaders to help them understand their critical roles in leading the changes. We want them to be visible and demonstrate their commitment to the transformation throughout the process. Uh, we use several different approaches like executive alignment workshops, where we develop executive charters to keep senior leadership engaged in the process. But ultimately, given the last example I shared, we draft a lot of communications and key talking points for them so that they don't say things like that chief medical officer did. But I get the impression that you can't always do that for every client. I mean, surely, does every transformation require this level of change management discipline? I mean, how would an executive know that this may be a problem? How would they know that he or she would need someone like you? It's a good question, Kyle. It, obviously, we don't get called into every single transformation happening around the world. But remember, my background is rooted in organizational psychology not finance, not technology per se. So I would argue that yes, for any disruption like this to be a success, it requires a rigorous change management approach. Our work is scalable though. So the level of effort required is going to depend upon the magnitude of change. So for example, if you're simply implementing a new finance solution that only affects five people in a small department, we can dial back much of our work. If, however, you're implementing a new time and expense system that affects all 1,000 or maybe 10,000 employees in your organization, then you're going to want to call someone like me. That's really how an executive would know that he or she needs us. It depends on the complexity of the change effort, the organization's own internal capabilities to handle it themselves, and the organization's history and culture for change. You know, with a company like Google, we all would expect them to be quite adaptive and embrace change. But for other organizations like maybe our local government agencies, we would likely expect them to be much more resistant to any disruption and therefore require a different level of change management support. Um, there's a very good reason why you've been asked to go and speak at the Association of International Certified Professional Accounting events uh, coming up shortly. And we'll touch on uh, the qualifications you had, because as you said, you are someone who has um, so much expertise to offer, not because you are someone who has come up the ranks of a an accounting or a professional finance organizational background, but you've come into it from a different side of education, of organizational psychology. So I'm going to ask you a bit about that in a couple of minutes. But first, what I just want to do is remind our listeners that they are listening to the Go Beyond podcast. I'm Kyle Hannan. We are talking to Dr. Jeremy Lurie, who is an organizational consultant. Are you ready for disruption? Join us in Chicago, Illinois, 
April 24th through 26th at the AICPA CFO Conference to find out. The CFO Conference keeps you at the cutting edge of the financial industry with 22 sessions developed for CFOs by CFOs, 33 subject matter experts, and two professional networking sessions. It's the one event of the year specifically designed to prepare you for disruption and provide you with the opportunities to advance your career and make your mark in the C-suite world. Get $75 off when you register before March 12th and use promo code CFO19 for an extra $75 off for a total savings of $150. But don't worry, if you're hearing this podcast after March 12th, you can still use promo code CFO19. And if you can't attend the CFO conference in person, you can still join us online so you don't miss out with all of our exclusive sessions streamed live in real time straight to your computer or mobile device. You'll also have access to remote networking, chat rooms, handouts, and slides, just as if you were there with us on site. Register today at AICPAstore.com slash CFO, and we'll look forward to seeing you at the 2019 CFO Conference. Let's pick up our conversation with Dr. Jeremy Lurie. Now, Dr. Lurie, can you tell us just a little bit more about your background, where you've come from, that gives us a sense of what you're able to offer people in the profession right now, and indeed in the the, the workshops and at the conferences that you will be speaking at shortly. Sure. Thank you. As I alluded to before, Kyle, I started my career in the big consulting firms, managed a lot of different change efforts, whether it was technology adoption, merger integration, process reengineering. But think about large companies going through massive changes. And with a background in organizational psychology, we focus on the leadership and the teamwork and collaboration. We focus on how to make processes um, more effective and how to streamline businesses. It's all from the focus of adoption, though. We don't want to implement millions of dollars in technology and not have people use the systems. That would be a waste of time energy, and precious resources. So we really focus on the people side of these transformation efforts to make sure that we deliver successful projects every time. So as someone who's been helping organizations at uh, at so many levels, it all comes back to understanding people. And that's the background of your particular education. Give us an idea of why you are a, a doctor. What is that professional qualification in? So when I was in my undergraduate studies, uh, coincidentally here in Chicago at Northwestern University, I took a lot of classes in communications and psychology. I've just, I've always been driven to help organizations better leverage their human capital while implementing new technologies to improve their companies. And I took that passion into graduate school, got my master's and PhD in organizational psychology. And the field is most closely aligned with human resources or sometimes industrial engineering. It really is all about the way people communicate in organizations, how they work together and collaborate to get the job done. And doing it in a practical way. So a perfect reason to ask you this question. If you look at what's happening now, what are some practical steps that you would recommend that would help the affected sectors of our profession become better at turning these disruptions into opportunities? What are some common things that they may be overlooking? Given what I just shared, it may not surprise you, but I'm going to say, start with the people, right? Many of us within the profession, CPAs, CFOs, even some of the more technical folks, CIOs, CTOs, tend to focus more on numbers and analytics. And with my background in organizational psychology, I'd offer it's critical to start with the people. We need to increase readiness for change by getting our employees involved right from the start and proactively managing any sources of resistance throughout the organization. It's important to sell the problem that you're trying to solve before you try to sell your solution. And through that process, learn what their challenges are so that your solutions might actually better fit their needs. You also need to manage the message. I've talked about the importance of communications. We need to establish two-way communication channels throughout the implementation and across all impacted groups, not just so that we're telling them what we want them to hear, but so that we're listening as well. We want to keep everyone informed about the changes and let them know what they can expect next at each step of the way. Otherwise, quite frankly, they'll make up their own stories 
And the pictures that they paint in their heads may not be closely aligned with ours. So my bias has always been communicate early and communicate often. Communicate what you know when you know it. So manage the message and increase readiness for change. That makes perfect sense to me. And once that all happens, uh, I've heard people then start to use the term go live uh, when they're talking about transformation efforts. Now, how come you don't focus on go live? Uh, that's part of that you know, consulting jargon that many of us have learned to use over the years. And I would offer there's a big difference between what we refer to as go live and adoption. Most project managers and project plans we develop, they focus on go live, simply trying to implement these new solutions on time, on budget, and on target meaning their success is driven by delivering on those technical objectives for the new system. Did we launch it on time and did it meet the needs that we had defined early on? But I'm hired to do a different thing. I'm hired to drive real adoption and create lasting change with my clients, not just go live with the new system, not just raise a checkered flag when we cross over to using the new system. So part of our methodology is to make it stick. We have to reinforce the transition and make sure that people actually follow any new processes and use that new system once it's implemented. That requires us to do much more work after the conversion happens. And we use different incentive strategies. We implement new performance management systems. We even often change onboarding and orientation programs to keep everyone from reverting back to the old ways of doing things, make sure that those desired behaviors truly stick. That's a really interesting thought because it's almost like saying that you've you've kind of reverse engineered the way that someone runs a race um, what you need to do is you need to break the tape because if you look at a runner the minute they break the tape at the end that's the equivalent of the go live everyone just stops running and wanders off the track whereas what you want to do is start with breaking the tape and then staying on the track in your lane and keeping going and I think that's that's fascinating. So uh, while we're on track, let's let's get ahead of the curve and look at the next disruption. What's one big change that you think lies ahead? And how would you recommend that our our profession gets ready for it? Whether they're sole practitioners, whether they're team leaders, or perhaps as heads of these uh, finance divisions at these enterprises at the level that you've been working at. What, what's next? What do we do to get ready for it? Earlier, I referred to baby boomers and the multiple generations in the workforce today. Uh, one of the other big disruptions we need to get ready for is that millennials, believe it or not, will soon be running our organizations, or at least many of our functional departments. That means a whole generation of less experienced and developing leaders who, generally speaking, embrace technology and prefer texting over picking up the phone. They're soon going to be in executive decision-making positions. So what do we do about that? For starters, stop labeling millennials as bad or different. Instead, we need to better understand their individual wants and needs and then create opportunities that match their career aspirations and their unique strengths. And that is so important a conversation. We interviewed a guest from uh, the Far East recently who was talking about the rise of the millennial CFO. So this absolutely taps into that reality. So what else can we do to engage millennials in the workplace? Uh, the general career path for baby boomers was up and out. They would accept any promotion opportunity, any pay increase until they retired, even if it meant uprooting their families and moving them across the country. Because it's about being recognized and valued for doing good work. As long as many of those baby boomers are still our senior executives, they look at millennials as being different or bad because millennials are very different as they're often driven by purpose, not money. Unlike any generation before them, millennials are likely to switch jobs every 12 to 18 months. So we need to find ways to keep them inspired and motivated if we don't want to lose them. That means defining a clear career path for them and one that likely includes special project assignments and horizontal job rotations as much as vertical promotions. And we need to provide the one-on-one -on -one feedback and support that they need to succeed in each position they assume. And that looks at the C-suite of tomorrow, but what about the C-suite of today? We did talk about change management. You've got to look at the people managing the change, and that means the people managing the organizations. 
How do you work with people who look at the, the changes that this adaptation requires and they resist it? Perhaps they don't get the need for it. Perhaps they are actively against it. How do you work to support those people to align with what has to happen? I learned long ago, a great book by Rick Maurer around resistance, talks about the three levels of resistance. Most of our communication tools, Kyle, actually work at level one resistance, which says people don't get it. They don't understand. So we develop another PowerPoint, an Excel spreadsheet. We lead another town hall meeting or send out an email from the CEO. And we hope that if we share more information with them, they'll get on board. But the reality is most people who resist change, it's below the surface. It's at a deeper level. Level two is defined as people who just don't like it. And they have a fight flight response to the changes going on. So one more email is not going to get them on board. We need to understand what are they fighting against? What don't they like? At level three is even more uh, deeply rooted in that person. And it's about not trusting you. You talked earlier about automation. Most projects that I'm a part of, when we go through automation, it's to minimize data processing, enhance management reporting, all these benefits. But people fear they're going to lose their jobs and they don't trust us that it's not about a layoff. So it's really important to understand people who resist change. They aren't doing it because they don't understand. They don't get it. They're doing it because they don't like it or they don't trust you. And it requires a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations or small group conversations to engage them and understand what are they resisting before we could figure out how to get them involved and get them to support a project. That's fascinating. You can't work on helping someone else adopt a change unless you start with yourself because you have to gain their trust first. I think that's really important. So for anyone who'd like to find out more about this topic in general uh, and about your work in particular, I know you've mentioned one book. Uh, where else would you recommend they look? What are some good resources to look sure. at? Sure. Uh, there are some other great books on change management and resistance to change that they might want to read. Some of the most popular are written by John Cotter, or Daryl Connor. One of my favorites is actually by William Bridges on managing transitions. Uh, Bridges teaches us that it isn't the changes that do you in, it's the transitions. And as we were talking about running a race and breaking the tape, we all need to manage the transitions related to these disruptions, give everybody a part in the process. It doesn't just stop when you cross that finish line. Um, one of the key messages from Bridges actually is you begin with an ending. You need to let go and leave the path behind you. And then you end with that new beginning that's starting fresh. So a couple of great books there. Uh, we also have a number of blog posts on our website. People are welcome to go to www.plusdelta.net. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel called Chief Exec Corner. If you go onto YouTube and look for Chief Exec Corner, we have a few quick view uh, videos around change management that might be helpful. And uh, the quick view is, I think, uh, a great way to end this with a, a quick message. What's one simple message you'd like to leave for accounting and finance professionals that will help them go beyond the disruptions that are coming? We need to understand, Kyle, that not everybody likes change. Quite frankly, very few people naturally embrace change and disruption in their lives. Uh, whether it's giving up my old BlackBerry in favor of an iPhone or simply buying a new pair of sunglasses after having my last pair for probably 10 years, even I resist disruption in my life, and I'm supposedly an expert in managing change. Uh, resistance, however, can be a good thing. It's just someone's way of saying that he or she feels threatened or maybe is confused by what we're doing. Uh, we often take it as an act of sabotage. But if we spend more time with that person or maybe that group of people who is or are resisting our changes, we might actually learn a thing or two that we haven't considered yet. We might even learn how to improve our solution before we go to implement it. So do make sure you engage any resistors in your change process as if they're there to help, not just hurt you, and that they just don't know how yet. So I alluded to this earlier. Don't create more detailed spreadsheets. Don't put out more PowerPoint presentations. Don't try to help them understand really have those direct and intimate conversations with them so that you know what they don't like or what they're afraid of. And remember, what you resist persists. So don't ignore it. Yeah. 
Great way to end it. Uh, thank you so much. That is Dr. Jeremy Lurie. Before we let you go, you've got quite a lot on your plate in the next couple of months. You've already told us that you're in Chicago right yeah, now. Yeah, I'll actually be leading a, another webcast on adaptive leadership in just a few weeks on February 25th, which is a Monday, um, talking about how to make 2019 our best years ever. And that's really geared towards CEOs and senior executives around strategic planning and innovation, trying to get their organizations to the next level. Uh, and as you've alluded to, uh, I'm actually very excited to be speaking at the upcoming uh, CFO conference here in Chicago again for the AICPA. Uh, I will be leading that session with a colleague of mine, uh, Bob Green, and the title is The C-Suite's Role in Success with Digital Transformation Initiative. So it'll be very much mirroring what we've talked about today around transformation and change and how to get people to adopt rather than resist these change efforts. That will be on uh, April 25th here in Chicago at the CFO conference. Marvellous. Organisational consultant, Dr. Jeremy Lurie. There is loads more to explore around change management, the importance of communications and uh, delivering successful transformation across all levels of the organisation. Uh, that includes the C-suite. And if you miss one of the events that uh, Jeremy will be speaking at, never mind, you can continue to listen to this podcast and we'll make sure the show notes include links to all the resources we've mentioned. Uh, there are two other websites we'd also recommend for listeners interested in taking this further. You might already be using one of these two websites depending on where you are in the world so you may already have one of these in your bookmarks there's the aicpa store.com slash go beyond disruption or if you use cgma store then just go to cgma store.com slash go beyond disruption that's where you'll find courses webinars and more professional development resources consistently updated to keep you ahead of the curve for exclusive insights and perspectives every week you can get our latest episodes wherever you already get your podcasts or your music and that means apple podcasts google podcasts iHeartRadio, stitcher spotify or tune in radio it's free it's automatic all you have to do to get them is just tap the subscribe or follow buttons and you can also just search for go beyond disruption podcasts anywhere online if you have a smart speaker you can also tell it to just play the latest episode of the go beyond disruption podcast that should work but we're not promising we hope you got something useful from this episode and if you did go ahead and share it with someone in your network who'd enjoy it too my thanks to dr jeremy lurry i'm kyle hannon and we'll be back soon with more insights that help you and your profession to go beyond disruption until next time goodbye Thanks for listening to this episode of Beyond Disruption, brought to you by the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants. Learn more about today's topic at AICPA-CIMA.com forward slash disruption. This podcast is designed to provide illustrative information with respect to the subject matter covered and does not represent an official opinion or position of the AICPA or AICPA.org. It is provided with the understanding that the AICPA and AICPA.org are not engaged in offering legal, accounting, or other professional service. If such advice or expert assistance is required, the services of a competent professional person should be sought. The AICPA and AICPA.org make no representations, warranties, or guarantees as to, and assume no responsibility for, the content or application of the material contained herein and especially disclaim all liability for any damages arising out of the use of, reference to, or reliance on such material. Such material. Such material. Such material.